as human beings, we tend to have a love-hate relationship with policies. I'm sorry, that's not our policy. I'm sorry, we can't do that. It's not something that we do according to the policy that we have. It's often a, a barrier that's put in place. But from a security perspective, these policies are things that everybody is made aware of. It's things that also allow you to do your job. So they become very important. Your security role starts and ends with these policies. The better policies you have, the better security you're enabled to have on your network. If you don't have very good policies, you're not going to have very much that you can do from a security perspective to keep your organization safe. So this is not something that you create and you're done. This is something that you build and you continue to build on. It is a living document that you're constantly enhancing, improving, and changing based on the way your organization is changing. Security policies cover a lot of different areas. They might cover physical security. What doors need locks? What happens when somebody enters the building and they're a visitor? How do you handle that person? What happens if you show up at work, you've forgotten your badge? There should be a set of policies associated with that. Policies are also technical policies. How do you handle change control on your firewall? What happens if a machine gets a virus? What if that particular machine has confidential information on it? These are all things that must be considered, and you have to make sure there's a policy so when that particular situation occurs, everyone knows the proper procedure to go through to handle that particular issue. There are policies for human resources. And from a security perspective, that becomes pretty important. You want to be sure when somebody is hired into the organization, when somebody is fired or leaves the organization, you need to know exactly what to do. You never want to have somebody's credentials still remain on when they are no longer part of your organization. So there's a number of things you could do from a human resource perspective. There's also business policies. Think about the things that you do as an organization and the way things are handled. How is information that is private to the organization handled? How do you handle the release of press releases and other internal documents within your organization? You need to set policies on that as well. If you're doing any type of encryption on your web servers, on your email servers, on your database servers, there's certainly a set of, of certificates that have been loaded on those machines. And being able to manage the certificates, keeping them secure, understanding who has access to those, how you build those certificates out, how you roll out trusted certificate authorities in your environment, all that falls under certificate policies. And this is something you really have to consider. Whenever you start building out encryption and decryption on your servers, you'll find very quickly the management of these certificates is quite a job. And if you don't have policy set up to allow, disallow, and manage changes of those things, it can become very, very bad over a long term because you're not sure exactly where your certificates are, who managed them, where the passphrases are associated with those certificates. It becomes a bit of a challenge. So make sure if you're doing more and more with certificates that you have a set of policies that you follow. And like everything else, that policy will continue to evolve as your certificates become brought in broader use and people are using them more on servers and on workstations. One of the more important policies you'll run across and one that we've dedicated a number of videos to is incident response. That is one of the things you always hate having to deal with as a security person, but it, very often it's one of the most important things you have to consider. This very, very short period of time when an incident occurs and the time you're able to respond to it can become very, very important for preserving data, keeping things private, maintaining uptime, and ultimately maybe even having legal repercussions down the road against someone who may have caused an incident in your environment. So that's a very broad set of policies. It is one that almost certainly you're involved your HR department, your legal department, and other parts of your organization to help build because you have to know when an incident occurs, what do I have available to me? What options are available? Who should I contact? What can I do? And the better the policy is, the better you'll be able to respond when those incidents happen. Almost every organization revolves around the people that are there. So there needs to be some very clear policies from an HR perspective on how you handle information dealing with people. And from a human resource perspective, one of the most obvious is a privacy policy. Whenever you're working in an organization, you're going to have private information about your customers. It might be a mailing address. In some cases like healthcare, you have some very, very confidential data of how people's health is. And that's something you want to be sure is private. So there should be some very specific policies about the privacy. And you should also have information in your privacy policy about the privacy employees should expect as well with their personal information. It's not just your customers, but also the people within your organization 
you have to consider. Whenever you have resources connected to the internet, you have resources internal, there should also be an acceptable use policy. In the United States, when you are at work, that is the company's computer, it's the company's network, and the company has control over that. In other parts of the world, it's handled a little bit differently. But there needs to be a policy set that tells exactly what is expected. That way, if somebody is using assets of the company and resources of the company in a bad way, you can at least point back to the policy and say, you knew this was not the appropriate way to handle these resources. And this covers a lot of different resources. It hand covers how people are behaving on the internet, the things that they're doing on the internet. Are, is instant messaging allowed? Are you allowed to browse out to any site you'd like? Or are there certain sites that are uh, not acceptable in your environment? How to use telephones? Are long distance calls appropriate? It, when should you be on the phone? What should you do with computers, especially computers that are mobile? Are you allowed to take them home? If so, how are you allowed to use them when you are outside of the company building? And mobile devices is an emerging security concern. These devices are connected often not even to your network. They're on a 3G or 4G network somewhere. They're using a wireless network somewhere else. How do you manage acceptable use of those or at least manage a set of policies associated with acceptable use. It becomes very important, and if you're dealing with security, you're going to be hitting certainly all of these things and many more. In your organization, there are some things you can do to reduce the amount of risk you have based on the policies that you have just as normal part of doing business. One of those may not be entirely obvious when you look at it, but it makes perfect sense, which is mandatory vacations. You don't have to tell me to take a vacation. I'm, I'm right there with you. And there's going to be time when I'm going to leave and take some time off away from work. But imagine someone who is doing something they should not be doing. What if you're taking money from the company and you're cooking the books a little bit and making sure that you're able to pocket a little bit on the side? You're not interested in going away for a week or two. That's going to open up the door for somebody to find out what you're doing. So you're going to always be at work. You're never taking a vacation. Why is James never? Never go on vacation. So you want to be sure that you have a policy to set mandatory vacations. You also want to have people rotate through. If you leave for a couple of weeks, we're going to need somebody else to handle those responsibilities. We don't want to just turn off everything and not have people have access to what you're doing over those next couple of weeks. And the longer someone is away, the better chance you're going to have to identify any funny business going on. So if fraud is occurring, we want to be sure that we have an opportunity to identify Identify it. And if you're in a very, very high security environment, there's a lot of money that's going through. This is something where you are a financial organization, a casino, maybe even healthcare or other things that where that data could be valuable if you sold it to someone else. We want to be sure that you take some time off, rotate somebody through your particular job. And of course, this is happening with everybody's position. We aren't really just looking at one particular part of the organization. This should be something normal that everybody considers so that you're able to keep an eye on everything that's happening in your environment. You can also think about maybe not necessarily wrapping that around a vacation. Maybe have people do different jobs every few months. We rotate from one job to another. Your responsibilities change a little bit as you rotate through those different jobs. It also means nobody is in control for any long period of time. When you start looking at these situations where somebody's been embezzling information, it's people that have been there for years and years and years, and they have a level of trust in the organization, and they unfortunately take advantage of that. If you're not in a particular position for any long period of time, then there's not as much of a chance that something like that can occur. So having someone rotate through every few months might be a good idea for your particular organization organization. In your organization, another important consideration might be the separation of duties. And there's different ways to separate these duties out. The first we'll talk about is one called split knowledge. That's where you might want to take information and take the knowledge and split it between different people so that no one person knows everything. If you're building a product, you have a secret formula. Maybe one person has half the formula. They hand it off to the next person, and that second person finishes what they know with the formula. Neither one of them knows everything. About about that secret formula. But put together, you're still able to have that product come out and have that final uh, piece come together without anybody knowing exactly how it was made. You might want to think about things where you've got a safe combination. People might have different numbers of the safe combination. In the digital world, we're able to take things like your private certificates and digitally split them up between different people. So that if you ever needed to bring that certificate together, everybody would have to turn in all of their pieces to really have 
all of that certificate. Another type of control is the dual control, where two people have to be present for this control to work. You often see this in the movies. If you're launching a missile, two, have, two people have to be there. Both have to have their keys. You turn the keys at the same time, the missile will launch. In your organization, you probably aren't launching a lot of missiles, but you may be in a situation where you have to protect some finances. So you may have a deal set up with the bank that you may only access the account if the two signatures are present on a piece of paper, or if you're accessing a safe, both of you have to be there with the safe keys in order to access what's in that safe. So another example of separation of duties, both the split control and the dual control. Another set of business policies, something you may have as just the normal part of what you do, but an important consideration is the concept of least privilege, which means your access, the information that you're able to gather, the things that you're able to do on a network or even in a building are based on what you have that's necessary for you to perform your job. If you need access to certain information on a file server and you only need to be able to read that information, then your rights and permissions should be set up to only read. You would never give you permission to write or even delete things that are on that server. If somebody was gained access to that server and you gave them the credentials to get to that folder and they accidentally deleted something and they had really no business deleting it, that comes now back to you. Why did you manage this method of least privilege in a way that would allow them something that went beyond their particular job requirements? In reality, management often chooses and decides what rights people have. As a security professional, it's your job to implement those rights in your organization. So it almost always goes back to management, which is how should the access be for these people? Should they be able to read this? Should they be able to write? Can they delete things here? Management gets to decide those things. And you as the security professional now takes that information as a liaison back to your information systems and figures out how can we set the least amount of privilege privilege for this particular user to have to this particular resource. It's a very important consideration, and we'll talk later in additional videos about auditing and checking those things out. It's very interesting how during an audit you'll find that people's privileges have been opened up a bit, and you need to roll them back a little bit to give them this concept of least privilege.